Because what I'm really saying is I don't think you're going to be the God over both. So is your favor going to be in one more than the other? Am I going to be a good wife? If not, then maybe I should just stick with the career plan. Because underneath all of that is the fear that really you don't think God's a provider. That's That was it for me. It was like, God, I don't know if you can provide me both. Can I have a great love life and have a successful career life that I love? I don't know. I think that's asking for too much. So I'll just choose one. Friend, God is a provider. He is the God over all. And so whether you're too focused on your career or you're too focused on your relationship or you're too focused on your children or you're too focused on being the PTA parent meeting queen or you're too focused on um, being a writer or too focused on being a sister or too focused on being the teacher or too focused on whatever it is because you're afraid that God's not going to provide in that area that you really want God to provide in, but you're scared to ask him because you don't think he's going to do it. Ask him. God's the God over everything. He's the God over all. He is the God over all. I believe every single person has a ministry. Ministry isn't just for preachers and it's not just for pastors. It's the way you shine the light that God gave you through his spirit in all spaces that he's trusted you to walk. That means you on your college campus. That means you at your corporate job. That means you in high school. That means you with your friends at the bar or the restaurant. That means you wherever you are, you have the responsibility to shine God's light light in that space and you get the chance to friend you are beautiful you are worthy and you are made to shine and I- what's going on how are we doing folks i am pumped for this episode i'm also pumped to be can we just have like a real life i'm a girl we know how girls girls are moment i'm blonde again and i'm stoked <laughs> Last week, as you probably saw with my mopping wet hair, as I coined that term, and I'm sure I'm going to get English majors on Instagram saying, that's not a term. If you're from the South, you can make up terms. Let's just come to terms with that. So I had mopping wet hair last week. It also made my hair look very brown. I had not had my highlights done in like 60,000 million years, and I just wasn't feeling very great. So I'm just coming to you as a girl saying, I'm so excited to be blonde again. My hair naturally, let's see. Can you see like, okay, probably none of y'all can see. These, so my highlights are done. My natural bl- hair is like, not blonde, it's not blonde. It's like, see that brown? That's like my natural hair. We went on like a scavenger hunt for that. I could have just illustrated that too with my words, but it's not blonde necessarily. It's not black. It's not super brown, but it's like a darker brown, dirty brown. So I'm so excited to be blonde again, especially for the summer. I just, we're feeling good. We're feeling like all the vibes. And I'm so excited for today's day three. Darn it. I was going to re, I was going to start out these episodes now by like reading the actual devotion instead of talking, but I always get talking with you guys. So, okay, serious mode. I'm going to read it now, and then we're going to talk about day three devotion of single, not incomplete. To the girl who's too focused on her career. Luke chapter 12, verses six through seven. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs on your head. Now that, this is not in the Bible. That's serendipitous because we were just talking about the highlights on my head. Um, Even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. So me, Annie Mayfield, with my super brown hair follicles last week, still of more value than many sparrows to my God than my now blonde highlighted hair. As are you. How I wish I could give you the biggest hug, wrap you in my arms, and tell you how beautiful, wonderful, and amazing you are. Not because I feel bad for you, but because I know you. Quite literally, I was you. I've been you. I am you. 
I'm not saying that taking a season to solely focus on hustling and building your career is a bad thing. In fact, I think it is an amazing thing. Sprints of the grind can be attributed for building some of the most prominent businesses, companies, and empires of our time. However, I'm afraid for those who are like me, you looked at having a successful relationship and a successful career as an either or, that it's impossible to have both. So like myself, you may have been heartbroken along the way and used your career as a hiding place. I need you to pause for a moment. It was in the moments that I paused that God was able to show me the misaligned definition of success that I held. Growing up, the media always portrayed successful women in two capacities. They were an amazing wife, mother, or they had a phenomenal career. Therefore, growing up, I thought my two possible metrics of success were either to be a great family figure or to make a lot of money. I never questioned if there were more metrics of success that I needed to align myself to like health, peace, mindfulness, harmony, energy, radiance, prayer life, divine connection, community, fulfillment, and service. What I failed to recognize growing up was that God gave us our success when he gave us our value. Just as the scripture says, you are of more value than many sparrows. All along, what I was trying to find in these areas of my life was my value. Little did I know that my value didn't lay out there. I had a season in my life where my love life was non-existent. My career was unfulfilling. And I began to enter a dark period. In that time, God was able to finally show me the truth. A relationship and a successful career are not the metrics of value to shoot for. You can have both and still be broken. You can have neither and be the most content version of yourself. So for my reader who's too focused on her career to have a relationship, I'm not asking you to ever, like ever, stop that drive. What I am saying is to take a second and recognize why are you driven towards that area so much? Are you running away from the fact you don't feel worthy of a romantic partnership? Maybe you feel like a failure in the significant other department. So you're trying to compensate by becoming extremely successful in your career. Or like me, you bought this idea that a woman can only be successful in one of two areas, a family or a job. And the family one was way too complicated. So you went the job route. Remember, true success isn't confined by two areas. True success lies in your ability to sit alone in a room stripped of all the things you consider to be your accolades, aka your salary, how big your family is, the size of your house, your awards, and be perfectly at peace with your creator. Perhaps when we release ourselves from the need to prove ourselves out there, we can finally connect to the one who completes us in here. Jot this down. Work or not, relationship or not, I am successful because I showed up for this crazy thing called life that God has blessed me with. Y'all. Oh my gosh, these glasses are very unclean. I can barely see the screen. Um, Fun fact, I'm kind of blind. I didn't know that until I thought it was very normal to be driving down the road. Like, wait, I can't really see the the stop sign. You know, I thought that was very safe and normal until I went to um, the eye doctor like a year ago because I was going through a time period where I was so stressed out because of my career, which that's how I'm tying this story back into what we just read, um, that my eye started twitching. Like it wouldn't stop. You know, those have you ever seen SpongeBob and you know, Mr. Krabs and that episode where his eye is like, looks like a, like a flutter. It just won't stop fluttering. That was me. I was literally Mr. Krabs and I had to go to the eye doctor. Cause I was like, yo doctors, there is, I look like Mr. Krabs. How do we fix this? Anyways, it turns out I was, uh, well, 
too stressed out is what they said. Which side note to my side note, don't you hate it when people are like, you're too stressed out. All I want to say is you telling me I'm too stressed out is, is stressing me out, which is contributing to the root cause of what you says is the problem. So let's not tell me to calm down because when you tell me to calm down, it automatically my aura ring will start screaming at me that my heart rate is increasing because you telling me to calm down makes me freak out that I'm not calm, which makes me less calm, which makes me anxious about the fact I'm anxious and stressed out about the fact that I'm stressed out, which makes my eye twitch more. So just a side note to that side note. But anyways, I had to go to the eye doctor and they were like, yeah, you're, you need glasses. You are. You're not seeing well. You're a hazard. You're you're very. Uh, I'm already not a great driver. The fact I can't see, they're like you should not be on the road, <laughs> specifically at night without glasses. So I do need glasses, um, and they're very unclean right now. But all that to say, I kind of along that thread of like being stressed out, career, all the stuff, y'all. I've always, 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 always been somebody that loves to work. I love it. I think it's awesome. I love a good project. I like figuring out what can I do. And I recently started going back to therapy and my therapist like is very much like, you know how they ask. They're like, okay, you know, where did this come from? Which parent instilled this in you? And both my parents are very accomplished people. And so I was modeled work growing up and especially my mom i mean my mom is a freaking powerhouse like she if you guys think i've ever accomplished anything cool you need to go look up beth mayfield on linkedin because sorry mom shameless plug for all your linkedin connects coming but seriously like it she is such a to me she was a model of someone that was such an amazing mother but also had such an amazing career um Growing up, though, I do think there was this. Let me turn this down a little bit. I like cannot see very well with this this light. This is my light, and it was just really bothering me. Growing up, there was this. Um, I think this this negative connotation with, or this story with women. It was like you could either be this woman that had this awesome career, or someone that had a family, and you were there for everything. And I so remember. This is so funny. I'm speaking about this, but I remember writing this chapter and I was thinking about one instance in particular. There was this, so Rachel Hollis, if you guys know who Rachel Hollis is, she's amazing. She's, she was like in the self-development space and she's actually the person that inspired me to write my first book because I read her book, Girl, Wash Your Face. And I, um, I read her book and I was like, honestly, this kind of sounds like me. And if she can do it, maybe I can too. I just wrote a book. And then um, she was such, like, I looked up to this woman like nobody's business, no one's business. And I love the fact that she spoke so openly about how she's a woman, she's a mom, she's a wife, she's doing all the things. Well, in COVID, I was, you know, building my nutrition business. I was building this podcast and again, still really looked up to her and she announced that she was getting a divorce. Um, and I'll never forget, I was in a serious relationship at the time and, you know, a relationship, we were like talking about our future and all this stuff. And when that announcement came out, the guy I was dating, uh, we, we had, we had a conversation about it because he knew what a big deal that was for me. Like, wait a second, what? She's getting a divorce. Cause what that did was it in my mind reinforced, oh, I I can't, if she's, if her career is one I aspire to have and she's getting a divorce and I already have this fear underneath that you can't have a good marriage and have an awesome career. I like, I remember it was like a, I mean, yeah, we had like an actual, like a very long strung out conversation because it really impacted me and it like reinforced that belief in my mind. Wow. It's true. You can't have both. And that's what I thought. And that's not true. 
But um, I remember at that time, you know how we are. It's like you you adopt this belief. And then when you're trying to reframe that belief, you look at people who show you, no, it is true. You can have both. And then when someone doesn't, you're like, oh, my gosh, maybe maybe I can't. I think the other side of that is, yes, there's this belief like you can't have both. The other side of that is you use one to hide from the other. Um, we all have comp compens com compensation, compensatory, compensatory. Am I saying that right? Compensatory. Like we compensate in different areas. I should have just said that. We, we use different areas of our lives to compensate. So for a long time, um, I remember when I d dated that guy and then it was super serious and it didn't work out. I used my career. I felt like such a failure in the relationship category, especially because it was at a time that a lot of my friends were getting engaged, getting married. I really, there was about two years I didn't date and it wasn't from lack of wanting to, it wasn't from lack of trying. It was literally from, there was just nobody I met that I was like, we click. Um, and I felt like such a failure on the relationship front. And every time I, I did go on a date and it didn't work out, whatever have you, I just, I came home from those feeling so lonely because all it did to me was reinforce this idea that I'm not good at this. And so it drove me further and further into my career because my career made me feel good. My career was this area that I was crushing it. My career was this, this thing that I was celebrated at. Um, and so because I felt so unsuccessful in the relationship love category, even the friendship category, um, my career was something I was like, okay, I have control over this, which of course is famous last words of anybody because God's like, oh yeah, you think you have control over that? Let me show you, you don't. Um, <clears throat> all that to say, I think what's so powerful is regardless if it's your career, we all have these avenues that if we don't feel confident in a certain place, we go to these other places to try to make us confident. Um, and you see this, like you see this time and time again, it's idolatry. You see this all throughout the Bible. You see this, like people worshiping Baal, people worshiping all these other gods. And we, we think idolatry doesn't exist today, but it does. It just exists in different capacities. Like I idolized my career. My career was this thing I was killing myself over um, that wasn't giving me life back because I was so, I felt so unworthy in these other areas. And in my career, it was this one place I felt somewhat worthy, right? Instead of going to God to seek that worth. And it's so funny, last week we were at a Bible study and we were talking about in the Old Testament when, was it Elijah? Yeah, it was Elijah. So Elijah basically did like this, um, this duel, this duel, is that what? Basically he was like, the god Baal, which is like this he represents the god of fertility for these like pagan worshipers in the Old Testament. He wanted to say, hey, let's put your God against my God, the God of Israel, right? Like Jesus, the son of God, like that God. And so they did. And these guys that were worshiping Baal put Baal down or put the altar down and started like dancing. They did all these things because their God of Baal wasn't responding. They started cutting themselves like they were doing so much to try to get a response from Baal. And Elijah, you know, put the offering out for our God. And in a second, he responded and consumed it by fire. And there's a lot that goes into that. But it got me thinking, what are the things in my life that I am making so much noise that I am cutting myself, killing myself over that are never going to be able to give me life back? And at the time of writing this, it was my career. My career was my bail. My career was my thing that I was just killing myself over. And it was never, ever, ever going to be able to give me life back. Because I was so scared of like actually looking at the thing that I really wanted. I wouldn't have told you I wanted a relationship, 
but I did. I just didn't feel good enough for it. And I also didn't feel successful enough for it because every relationship I felt like I got in didn't work out. And I'm curious for you, what's your bail? What's that thing? Like in this chapter we read about, it was my career. But for some of you, it's not your career. It's your body. It's, it's your relationship. It's your friendships. It's your grades. It's the long string of letters before your name that starts with doctor. It's the amount of degrees you have. It's whether or not you can graduate early. It's the roommates you get to live with. It's the parties you get invited to. It's the amount of people that follow you back on social or that you follow on social, or it's the, um, it's your ranking. It's whether or not you make the sports lineup. It's how many grandkids you have. It's if, you know, if you get that job or not. It's if you get that recognition or not. It's if that sale comes in or not. It's how many books you've completed or not. It's what you could do for God or not. I was listening to a podcast earlier about like so many of us think we're planting seeds for the gospel when really we're just planting seeds for our notoriety. We don't really care about bringing people back to God. We want people to think we care about bringing people back to God. And we care more about the clicks and the likes and how many views something gets. What's your bail? What's the thing that you are killing yourself over like they were in the Old Testament? That is never going to be able to give you life back. Because what I've learned is if the thing you're sacrificing for isn't God, you can give everything to something, everything to something. But if that thing you're giving everything to isn't God, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Prince of Peace, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, creator of the universe. If it's not him, it will give you nothing in return. And how cool is it? Like in that Old Testament scripture, these people were like cutting themselves over trying to get the attention of their God, which was Baal. And we had a God that bled for us to get our attention. When you recognize that, when you recognize that you had a God that bled for you to get your attention, you recognize that there's a reason he tells us to seek first the kingdom. There's a reason he tells us to invite him into the process with prayer. There's a reason he tells us to pray without ceasing. There's a reason he tells us this day our daily bread, to take it one day at a time, to seek first him. There's a reason he tells us in all things to be grateful and thankful because by connecting with him, by understanding his magnitude, by understanding how big and how vast and how wide he goes, you understand that you're not limited to one capacity when you serve a God that covers all capacities. The reason I can confidently sit here now and say, I will one day be God willing, an amazing wife and God willing, an amazing mother and God willing, an amazing grandmother and, and continue to be an amazing podcast host and continue to be an amazing salesperson and continue to be an amazing writer is because the God that I serve, the God that I serve is the God over all of those things. He's not the God over just my sales career. He's not the God over just my podcast career. He's not the God over just my relationship. He's the God over everything. We have a God that created the world, spoke life into the world. He's an author. He's a creator. He's a father. He's a son. He's the Holy Spirit. Like God is so many different things. So whatever he's called us to, he's also the God of those things. And he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So the reason you can be rest assured that whatever God has called you to, he will provide what you need in that season for that thing he's called you to is because he's the God over everything. 
Now, when your view of God gets limited, that's when your view of what you can do gets limited. And you begin to think, well, can I really be a good mom and a good CEO? Can I really be a good friend and a good girlfriend? Can I really be a good wife and a good director? Well, if God's called you to those things, how do you know if God's called you? Well, I think it's obvious. If you have that desire in your heart, and it's from God, not just you desire it because everybody else has it, but you really like you internally desire this thing. I think it's from God because think of all the things in this world you could desire. Like out of all the occupations in this entire world, for some reason, you want to be a lawyer. Do you know how many occupations you could have desired to be? For some reason, you want to be a lawyer, a teacher. For some reason, you want to be a mom. Some people literally don't have that desire. Paul did not have a desire to be a husband. But you have a desire to be a husband. You have a desire to be a wife, right? I think God gives us those desires, those internal, intrinsic, motivated desires. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Now, it might not be on your timetable. And I know we love our timetables. I know me, I love my timetables. When the time is right, the day it is right, he will give you your daily bread for that day. And that's how I know you can have both because we have a God of both. We have a God of all. David was a husband and a king. He was a shepherd and an appointed king. Jesus was a carpenter and a preacher and the son of God. Paul was a preacher and a tent maker. Peter was a fisherman and a preacher. Um, I could go on. Mary was a friend and the mother of Jesus. Um, Let's see. This is kind of fun. Where else can we go? Where else can we go? Moses. Moses was terrified of public speaking, but God called him. He was also a brother. He was a brother and a speaker and a trailblazer. He led those peeps through the Red Sea. Like we get so limited in our view of God. Oh, this is good. I want to add this too. The other day I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about like bold prayers. That's something I've been working on. It's like when I pray, I want to pray bold. I want to pray like I really believe God is as big as he is. And um, because we can kind of get routine in our prayers. And he was talking about how like with the with the Israelites, like the Israelites just got very comfortable with God and they stopped calling on God with the vastness that he is and the, and the magnitude that he represents. And, and he's the guy in this podcast says something so good. He's like, I want to pray in such a way that here on earth, the way I pray, I look like a fool to people rather than getting to heaven and looking like a fool to God. And what he meant by that is like so many of us, we pray so small. We pray so small that God would probably be like, I mean, yeah, I can do that. But is that it? Like, is that all you expect me for? And so I just encourage you, friend, today, like, how are you praying? Are you praying in such a way that it's like, okay, God, you've called me to these things. He who began a good work in me will be faithful to complete it. Are you praying like that? Or are you doing what I did before I had this revelation and put this in this book, which was like, God, I, you know, I, do you want me to be a wife or do you want me to have a career? Because what I'm really saying is I don't think you're going to be the God over both. So is your favor going to be in one more than the other? Am I going to be a good wife? If not, then maybe I should just stick with the career plan. Because underneath all of that is the fear that really you don't think God's a provider. That's, that was it for me. It was like, God, I don't know if you can provide me both. Can I have a great love life and have a successful career life that I love? I don't know. I think that's asking for too much. So I'll just choose one. Friend, God is a provider. He is the God over all. And so whether you're too focused on your career or you're too focused on your relationship or you're too focused on your children or you're too focused on being the PTA parent meeting queen, or you're too focused on um, 
being a writer or too focused on being a sister or too focused on being the teacher or too focused on whatever it is because you're afraid that God's not going to provide in that area that you really want God to provide in, but you're scared to ask him because you don't think he's going to do it. Ask him. God's the God over everything. He's the God over all. He is the God over all. And that's something that I, I think when we go back to this initial, like the, the verse for it, Luke chapter 12, six through seven are not five sparrows sold for two pennies and not one of them is forgotten before God by even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are more of value than many sparrows. I think we forget who we are when we come to God. We're his kids. He is the God of the cosmos. Like he is so big. He is so bold. He is so beautiful. He's also our father. He's our father. And he delights in hearing from us. So when you go into that work meeting, when you go into that podcast interview, when you go into that tough relationship conversation, when you go into your conversations with your friends, you can say, dad, I need you to be in this with me. Hey, dad. I would really like to be both an awesome wife and an awesome CEO. Hey, dad, I would really like to be both an awesome friend to my girlfriends and an awesome girlfriend to my boyfriend. Dad, I would really like to be a really great mom with the kids that you trust me with, if it's in your plan for me. I'd also really like to give them an example of what it means for a mom to work a job too and be a provider too. Hey, dad, can you help me with that? If it's in your plans for me, knowing that if it's not in your plan, in his plans for you, he has something even better in store for you, but he's the God of all of it. He's the God of both. Don't limit God into one ask. Don't do that, friend. He's the God of everything. Today, I had someone say, I don't know how you do it all. And I'm afraid you're going to get burnt out, which burnout's real. I've been burnt out before. And it bothered me. And I wonder, and I was like asking God, why did that bother me? I think right now. It's, um, it bothers me because they're limiting me to their ability. God's going to call you to different things. You by nature, you know, Jeremiah 1, 5, before I knew you, I, before I formed you, I knew you, before you were born, I set you apart. God made you unlike any other person. And so the way he's designed you, the way he's going to sustain you, other people tend to limit you to the extent at which they limit themselves. I'm asking you not to do that with yourself or other people. I'm also asking you not to limit God to the extent at which you limit yourself. I'm not saying you can't have boundaries. I'm not saying you can do everything. I am saying that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it because you matter to him and you're valuable to him. And if he put a seed on your heart, he will give you the bandwidth and the energy to carry it out. Whether that's being a mom and a boss, a mom and a friend, a mom and a daughter, a mom and a CEO, a mom and an employee, a mom and an entrepreneur, a wife and an entrepreneur. God's got you, but he can't give you. Well, I was going to say he can't give you what you don't ask for, but he can and he will. Um, but maybe the biggest thing he's going to give you right now is just the awareness that you need to ask for it and receive it because he can give something to you, but he can't make you receive it. So ask him to be there in everything that he's calling you to be and that you desire to be knowing that if he doesn't provide in that area, it's because he has something even better for you. And I love you. I'm cheering you on and we need you. So take care of yourself. I mean it. Love you guys. 
And I hope that this blessed you and encouraged you, reminded you that God gave you a unique light and it is your job to shine it in this world because we need you to. That being said, if you were blessed by this message and you can think of anybody else that also needs this type of encouragement, do me a favor, hit like, hit subscribe, Leave me a comment. Uh, it helps me out a lot and helps this message that I do believe God gave my heart to share with the world gets out. I hope you have such an amazing rest of your day.